I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you are listening to or watching Radio Maine. Today I have with me Dr. Emily Isaacson, who is the founder and artistic director of Classical Uprising. Thanks for coming in today. Thanks so much for having me. So you and I um, go way, way back, way before you became Dr. Emily Isaacson, and your kind of doctoring is actually a little bit different than the kind of doctoring that I do. Yes. Uh, although I like to say that you're healing bodies and that I'm trying to heal souls. So, you know, we have that connection. But yes, I have a doctorate in, um, in conducting and in uh, literature, music literature. And that was uh, quite a bit of work to get that. Oh, my Lord. Yes. I, uh, I now teach at Bowdoin College and speak with, with uh, college students a lot and say, think hard before you go to graduate school, because it is not only a big investment of time, but really emotional resources. My graduate school um, experience was brutal. And given the industry that I'm in, it was actually good training, but it made for some very unhappy times. And I'm really grateful I met my husband before I started that program because I needed all the support networks I could get to, to get through that. Well, in, the, in that short couple of sentences, there's just a lot to unwrap. <laughs> Sorry. That's, uh, no, I think it's completely fine. I'm, I'm, I'm interested in the word brutal. Tell me, tell me what you mean by that. So the way conducting graduate school works is that you, um, in the same way that you would like, say, write an essay and then get critiqued either in person or by a red pen by your professor, that's what's happening with your conducting, your music analysis, your musicianship analysis, but in front of an ensemble of anywhere from 12 to 100 people. And so it's this very like public critique. And it's um, conducting is in a very old boys club, old world uh, industry. And so the, the critique words are not couched in a compliment. There's no compliment sandwich happening there. It's, uh, it's direct. And uh, if you're lucky, it's specific so that it's something that you can actually take away. But um, for what for, I would say my primary mentor in um, my doctoral program, the closest I ever got to a compliment was, huh, that didn't suck as much as I thought it was going to. <laughs> so um, so that was graduate school. It's also a really, they're really tiny program. So I went to the University of Illinois for my doctorate. It's a school of 60,000. And there were um, six people in my program, three accepted every year. And only half of my program spoke English fluently. And so, and we were sort of pitted against each other. Like the way the program was designed is we were fighting for podium time. And so there really, there was, there was not a lot of... Um, love coming from our teachers. And there was not a lot of love towards each other because we were fighting for the same opportunities. Um, uh, so I'm really grateful I have great friends. I'm grateful I met my husband beforehand. And um, I love ice cream. So there we go. So I guess I'm most interested in this idea that in this day and age, one would think it would be difficult to go through an educational experience and have that level of competitiveness and enmity toward your students. And I think it sounds like maybe a little from the professors toward the students. Absolutely, yeah. So why do you think that conducting um, is, I don't want to say allowed to get away with it, because that's that sounds a little critical, but um, why do you think that that particular program is still in that mode of education? That's a great question, and actually not something that anyone else has asked me. So bravo, Dr. Belial. Um, I think two things. One is there's been a real generational shift in the last 10 years, like really quite recently, and it's still happening right now. So I think a lot of the professors and way of educating um, that I experienced were sort of established in the, in the 70s and 80s. And professors hang on for a really, really long time. <laughs> um, so I do think that there's that, some of that is changing. But I think that um, especially orchestral conducting in the orchestra world is extremely hierarchical. It's really, if you think about it, you know, Verdi Requiem was just at the PSO um, this weekend and they did a brilliant job. But there's like more than 200 people on that stage, depending on the size of, of the ensemble. And 
Um, the conductor is the dictator, like no question. There's, and you might collaborate with a concert mister, mistress or mister um, a little bit, but it's not a dialogue or a collaborative process in the way that you would expect a C-suite or a sort of other industries of being. And that's one of the things that I've really, um, in my organization, Classical Uprising, really tried to change because I don't think that that's the best formula for making great art and great music. Um, I also don't think that that's conducive to the society and era that we live in. If 200 people are on stage and only one person gets to be in charge, and guess what? Most of the time, they're white men, often from Europe, older white men, that really limits who is um, setting the narrative and who is uh, telling the narrative, giving the descriptions. And so in my organization and in my artistic process, I really strive to be collaborative. I'm very upfront at the beginning of my rehearsals with um, my orchestras, I'll say, I am one of many talented artists in this group, and I look forward to hearing your ideas. I'm here to mediate an artistic conversation and to make it efficient, but we're all in this together. And I think that's a real chamber music approach, which is why orchestra players often really, or just musicians in general, really love chamber music, because it's a more democratic um, co musical conversation. And I try and bring that ethos to large ensemble work. So I want to back up just a little bit because I know some of the people who watch this or listen to this show are art um, fans, and some of them are just fans of Radio Maine. Um, we don't have that many people maybe who are specifically music fans. So tell me, what is chamber music and how does that compare to orchestral music or ensemble music? What are some of the definitions there? So all these terms are a little bit flexible in um, the 21st century. I would say that um, historically, chamber music would be like 10 or less people. If you think about the string quartets rise in the 18th and 19th century, um, you know, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. There's a lot of like piano sonatas or that kind of like four, five, six people. Once you sort of get above 12, it's really hard to be self-led. And that's where an orchestra or a conductor comes in. Um, there was this jump in the 18th. So I tend to work in the um, Baroque era and in the contemporary era. And there was this shift that happened in the late 19th century where um, – Either music was very small so that it could be performed in the home or the court, or it was enormous to show off the splendor of riches. And so um, that dichotomy really um, extended into the beginning of the 21st century. Now it's a lot more mixed. And you see groups like A Far Cry, that's a string orchestra of 20 that's self-led. So it's really, it, 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 the term doesn't mean quite as much, but it usually means whether there is a conductor or whether it's self-led. So it sounds like partially the leadership style can shift as a result of the size of the group. Yep, but not always, yeah. So how does one get a collaborative leadership um, feel going in a large in a larger group, in an orchestral group, aside from framing the conversation in the way that you've described? We are all um, artists here, and I'm, I'm here to mediate a conversation. So I have over a decade of training in studying scores, in waving my arms around, in understanding what the historical and social um, uh, aspects that were behind the music in um, the theory of music. But uh, I have far less training in bowing, in articulation, in, uh, gosh, all sorts of, of really technical aspects of um, the instruments that make a big difference or they make a small difference, but to us they feel like a big difference to the way that a musical phrase is approached or is attacked. And so I'll turn to my concert mistress and I'll say, how should we bow that? Hopefully we're having that conversation ahead of time. More like, should we do that articulation here with a tenuto or staccato? And like, what's the feel there? Or like, what what do you think? Should we be taking this like up tempo a little bit more? Um, or especially in Baroque music, there's a lot of conversation around what we call continuo. So one of the things that's so cool about Baroque music is not all the music that you hear is written out, only some of it. And so there's this group in the orchestra called the continuo that is cello, um, harpsichord, and bass 
bass usually, and they're figuring it out as they go. What chords do we play? Should we put a you know a seventh in there? Who's playing? Who of the three of us is playing in that moment? And so rather than saying this is how I'd like it to be, I say let's try this. I don't think that worked. What what should we try next? Um, and that's that's how I do a collaborative approach. So what you're trying to do is enable people to work to their highest potential for the benefit of the larger group and to take ownership. And to take ownership. Oh, that's interesting. So if somebody is going to decide to bow in a certain way, you want them to really commit to that and to decide that this is what's right for the purpose that you're trying to achieve. I think it's more that um, sometimes I think my job as a conductor is to make people atten pay attention to this moment. We've all got so much going on in our lives, and um, professional musicians have a different gig every couple of days, and they're practicing for one gig while they're at another gig. And so my job is, this is the most important thing in your life right now. Commit to this moment and this art. And so it's not so much that I want them to commit to the Boeing because that is like the ultimate, you know, truth telling, but more that in saying like, I've really thought about this and I think this is the Boeing that we should use. It means they're committing to this musical experience and this artistic performance um, as compared to the other things. I think that's a really great distinction. And I, I'm guessing that it probably is more challenging to be a conductor in this day and age, perhaps, than before we had all of the digital information bits coming at us all of the time in the rest of our lives. It is and it isn't. I would say from um, from inside the industry, in terms of like working with other professional colleagues, uh, you know, we do a lot of um, swapping scores and markings digitally, and so that's actually like really effective and helpful. It's really wonderful to be able to say like check out this recording, and rather than emailing me a cassette, you know, I can just go on Spotify and look it up. So in in the industry, um, I I think it's really beneficial. I think what's challenging is about running an organization um, and building audiences. So I really feel that um, my biggest competitors, for Classical Uprising's biggest competitors, are not other arts organizations, but are Netflix and Billy's Birthday Party. I am like competing for people's attention. I'm competing to get people out of their houses, out of their jammies, and to come to something and to commit to something ahead of time by registering or buying tickets for it. Um, and to saying, I have, you know, our family has Billy's birthday party, but we're also going to go do this thing because this is important in our lives. And that that's where I think the digital age makes things difficult because it's so easy to stay at home and um, sort of passively absorb culture. So how do you get people to pay attention? I mean, there's the, if you're a conductor and you're waving your arms about, Clearly, that is a means of getting people to pay attention, but you know there is some point where that's not really going to translate into the rest of the world because I don't think that everybody pays attention to the waving of the arms. How have you brought people in to see classical uprising? What what generates interest and makes people excited? And I would actually say that if I can get them to watch me wave my arms, then I've already won because m when you come to an event almost always people say, that was amazing. I'm like, I'm so glad I was here. This is the best part of my month, you know, whatnot. So it's really, again, I got, get, uh, getting people off their couches, out their doors and committing to coming. Um, so we spent a lot of time at Classical Uprising thinking about that. What is it that people need in their lives right now? And um, a lot of classical music was clearly created before the digital era. And so, you know, Mendelssohn, for example, would throw these awesome parties in his greenhouse and all of uh, his community would come. And it was social, um, you know, it's not happening every night. It is a highlight and you're, you're looking for cultural and intellectual stimulation because you might have books, but you don't have television or radio. And so that's what that was then, but we've got all these other things now. And so we really ask ourselves, what is it that this day and age, this community, this the, this moment in history, what is it that we crave? And um, I think it's community. I think that, uh, I don't think there's, you're better to speak at this Dr. Belial than I am, that there's like all this science that shows that 
actually social media distances us from each other. And that while we have all these opportunities to connect, they often are not meaningful connections, that they, they, um, there's a real wall between that. And so we really highlight the social and community aspect of live performance. Sometimes that's about um, really putting it at the forefront. So for example, we do um, at the Portland Bach Experience, which is our June festival, we do a carnival concert and it's a street fair concert. We're performing in the outdoors, but we also invite you know, upwards of 30 um, other arts organizations, educational organizations, artisans, food trucks, breweries to come and it's a multi-hour event and it's like a house party. Come whenever you want, leave whenever you want and, you know, enjoy and and the music is part of the fabric there. Um, Or we just did a salon concert at the Portland Art Gallery and uh, we build in time to socialize. So doors open a half an hour early, you show up, you get a glass of wine, you walk around this gallery, you talk about the art with the person next to you, but you also meet new people. And we've had a lot of friendships develop out of those kinds of um, experiences. And we build in time for them to have conversations with the musicians. It's a much more intimate experience. Um, Because again, I think bringing down that wall, not just between each other, but between us and the art. How do you get intimate? How do you get connected to the to the art makers again. Um, So I think I've lost a little bit of track of what the original question was at this early hour, but, uh, but, but that's what we're working on is how to make meaningful connection, meaningful music for people. One of the things I know that the Portland Art Gallery does really well is to connect people to art at wherever they're coming from. Some people are true collectors and connoisseurs and have a lot of background in art history, for example, and others are really just standing in front of a piece and saying, wow, I, I feel really touched by this Anne Trainer and Demang piece, for example. So in your case, I'm going to think there must be a parallel because there are some people that know a lot about music and actually know what Baroque is, if you bring it up, and other people who are just like, oh, I can connect with that for whatever reason. There's something about that. So how do you bridge the divide? How do you kind of speak those different dialects to the different types of people who you're trying to bring in? That's a great question, and I love that you said dialects because um, I what we do at Classical Uprising is we say we're going to present the same great music, and it's going to be great music, but we're gonna package it differently depending on what your needs are. So as you said, there's still a community of nerds, whether it's art history nerds or music nerds, and they really geek out about this stuff and they want to to dive deep. So we do traditional concerts or the salon experiences for them. But then, I, it's important to me that people see classical music not as vitamin C, vitamin culture, something that they're supposed to go to or experience like to raise their children well or because it's good for their health or whatever, but because it's really entertaining and it's really, it's exciting or it's inspiring or it creates a space in their heart in a way that something else does. And so a lot of what we do is repackage the same music in different contexts. So for example, we do this thing, Flight of the Bumble Beer, where we work with a brewery and we do a flight of five beers, five ounce beers, with a flight of five minute pieces of music. And we pair the beer profile and the musical profile together. And that's sort of a signal to the audience that, okay, this is different, so you don't need to know anything. Come if you like music, but also come if you like beer. And because this is kind of a quirky thing that you've not heard of before, maybe you can just show up if you don't like either and expect that something cool and funky is going to happen there. Or we do a program called Bach Ben's Yoga, where it's um, a silently led yoga class to box cello suite overlooking the Eastern Prom or in the middle of a public park. And again, it, these trying to create more than one entry point. Music is one of the entry points, but um, whether it's food or experience or family friendly or the environment, a secondary entry point so that you'll um, you'll give it a shot. And what I strive for the most is to put classical music in really unexpected places so that people, their expectation of what a classical music concert is, 
is disrupted and they don't know what to do anymore. And therefore, they just open their heart to the art artistic experience. And I think that's really the most powerful when you can shed all the expectations and just be with the art, whether it's standing in front of the painting or being in a musical experience. So I believe that when I interviewed you a few years back, your children were quite a bit younger and they're nine and six now. That's right. You and your husband yes. um, have a nine and six year old. So have you found that their appreciation of music has um, changed over time or does it look different than it once did? Ooh. So I think one of the really great things I've been able to give my kids and also their friends and our community is feeling like classical music and attending live performance is like a totally normal thing. Um, that you go trick-or-treating and you go, um, you know, cookie decorating parties at Christmas and you go to meet in concerts. Um, and so, you know, my son is six, but since he was four, he could tell you the difference between a cello and a bass or, you know, uh, they feel very comfortable around music. They also think that conductors are women, that they don't see any gender divide um, and that they feel totally like this is their space. We had an awesome concert last spring. It was the U.S. premiere of a piece um, by a composer who, while she was here in residency with us, won German Artist of the Year. Her name is Shelley Grave. And this really like edgy classical music meets punk rock, meets choral hymn, meets jazz. I mean, it was just like so dynamic. And um, we did it in this sort of very spacious area down at Thompson's Point. And in the middle of the concert, my son just started breakdancing because that was his emotional and physical response to the music. And I love that. Um, so I think that that hasn't changed. Um, I think one thing that we're talking a lot about right now with our kids getting a little bit older is it actually takes a ton of work to be good to be a good musician. And it's not sexy like soccer where you can like score a goal early on and like feel that buzz when you're just starting out learning to play an instrument there's a lot of grunt work and and uh while pushing kids to do that was something that was totally appropriate in parenting you know 100 years ago or even 50 years ago there's a lot more questions about that now so i think there's a more of a disjunct for them now about like okay i feel really comfortable around this music but how do i become a part of it? Do I have to work really hard? Do I, am I a listener? Am I a participant? Um, so I think that that's the piece that has changed. And so I'm putting more of an emphasis than ever on showing how fun it is to make music, how that it's a real, it is a team sport, making, showing how, um, art, artists and instruments work together, um, to, to, in, not just taking down the barriers to access and to sort of presentation, but also, hey, a simple melody can be really beautiful. It doesn't have to be something super complicated. So I would say that's what's changed. So the, the last thing I want to ask about is something that we kind of started the conversation with, and that is teaching. Because what I hear from you is that actually communication and education, although that that sounds a little bit like a um, kind of professor on a box, that's not what I intended to be, um, is a pretty big part of what you do. You're, it's outreach, it's communication, it's relational. Um, and you are actually doing this at Bowdoin College, which, uh, as you know, that is my alma mater. So thank you very much for doing that. My pleasure. And I know you grew up not that, that far away from Bowdoin College. So tell me what it, it is like to translate your experience, your work, your love, your passion into a classroom setting and kind of generate that same sort of excitement for the students that you teach and without even knowing what their potential futures may hold. Yeah, great question. Um, so I think one of the challenges is the same with audiences, which is just getting their attention. Very few of them are music majors. And so when they've got three or four other competing classes with assignments, how do I make them be present and care about this? Um, I also think that they're in a really interesting developmental moment in that it's so competitive to get into college. Um, and Bowdoin is such an incredible college and hard to get into that these students have been working 
so hard for the last four or five years of their life. And now I wouldn't say they've arrived, but they've, they've, they've crossed a major hurdle. And so to really help them connect, not just with the like, did you do this correctly? Or like, you know, can you sing the scale appropriately or whatnot? But like, what does it mean to make art? What does it mean to be expressive? And, you know, I'm drawing upon a much longer period of time of emotions and experiences to respond to the music. But how can I make that meaningful to them in their moment in time? Um, I think there's also, uh, there's at Bowdoin and throughout the United States right now, there's a real focus on decentering the Western canon of classical music. And um, on the one hand, I totally agree with that for all the reasons that I'm sure lots of people on the show and, and in other places have talked about, not the least of which is there's some really awesome contemporary music that's responding to this moment in time. And I love, I love doing that kind of work. What is, mo what is music that is responding to all the crazy things that we're going to right now? But I am really inspired by the fact that 300, 400 years ago, people were essentially living the same lives. They were like going to work every day. They were loving their partners. They were raising their children, you know, all of these things. And they were creating art that expressed their moment of time. And so I get a lot of inspiration from either um, feeling like, wow, isn't this amazing that we're part of this like species that just exists over, I don't know, some scientists will be able to tell you how many years. But for me, I'm thinking about like, four or 500 years of musical tradition and that I can sing or play a piece of music from hundreds of years ago and like kind of time travel and tap into that moment. And that's true even more when, or maybe not more, but with pieces of music that actually take, um, approach the same same life experiences in really different ways. So I'm going to totally nerd out here for a moment, but one of my favorite pieces of music is Heinrich Schütz's Musikalische Exequien, which was written during the 30-year war. And everyone around him, Heinrich, is dying, whether it's from war or um, famine or disease. I mean, it's just like so horrible. And we think of death as this horrible thing. And having just gone through COVID, that's very present. But in fact, in the Lutheran tradition and during his time, death was a release. Death was like, I now don't have to worry about all of these things. And I can't wait to get to heaven and to be a part of this like beautiful life. And, um, and I think that is really comforting to have that juxtaposition of approach. And, and so when I'm singing that piece of music or conducting that piece of music, I'm time traveling not just to a historical moment, but also to kind of a psychological moment that I can choose whether or not to accept or be a part of. But that feeds my intellectual and spiritual curiosity in a different way. And so I try and make those things available to my students as well, that it's like, it's not just what you're learning in your classrooms and on TikTok, but like, let's enter the world of learning in all these other ways um, through music. Um, and I feel so lucky I get to do that work. I think it's really um, important to be able to do while we're simultaneously decentering that we remember that each of these traditions still have some validity. So I think what often seems to come across is that by decentering we give we give away any centering, and I think that that um, it causes all of us to feel a little bit more unstable. So if there's a way that we can continue to value that that center, but also be able to be open to other musical traditions, or you know I'm thinking of my daughter Abby, and uh, she she did her master's in history, and she has a huge interest in food history. So her way of connecting to the past is kind of food ways and, and how are things That's done. That's very cool. That, yeah. We should do a project together. Yeah. I Well, you know, I she's a, I actually think you'd really like her. Abby, if you're hearing this, call That's, me. That, yeah. That's right. She lives right near you, by the way. Woo! Abby, but anyway, uh, possibilities. So I, I do think that what you're describing is an interesting thing that we can maintain respect for, for all and also challenging because it does require that we kind of have have an open mind and also be okay with kind of who we are and some of the traditions that we ourselves have. Yeah, and I would just change one of what I agree with you, except for one word, this respect word, because I think what I try really in, um, 
so much of history and of classical music and high art is like at an arm's distance. And so like, yes, we can respect it, but can we also learn from it and embrace it and have it speak to us in this moment? A lot of the work that I do is putting traditional or classical pieces, historical pieces in context and dialogue with either a contemporary experience like beer or, although that's, they were drinking way more beer back then, but anyway, or contemporary music. And um, I think that it's that kind of connection that says we're all just human, you know, just no matter what the age and science around us, we're the same humans. And that that's really powerful to me. Well, I appreciate your clarifying the word choice because I, I think you're right. I think words are very important. And and I still, even today, words that meant one thing, mm -hmm. perhaps when I was going through my training, they mean something very different. So always being aware of the nuance as it comes to communication. And so the, the idea of respect, putting things at arm's length, I mm. think that's a, that's a great um, kind of delineation that you've created. Well, thank you. I think a lot about these things. Yeah, well... Honestly, I do too. Good. So, yeah, we're kind of. Honest. I see a bottle of wine in our future. Uh, that, that very well. <laughs> that very well could be on some classical music, apparently. Absolutely. Yes. I encourage people to look up Classical Uprising, which is based in Portland, and also maybe spend some time uh, thinking about getting to know Dr. Emily Isaacson, who is the wonderful founder and artistic director of Classical Uprising. Emily, thank you so much for coming in and talking to me today. Thank you. And I would offer, if you go on our website, um, I have a playlist that has classical and other kinds of music. And that's a really um, great entryway to exploring connections and also seeing what piques your curiosity. Okay. There's there's my homework. And for, good. good. And for those of you who are listening or watching, there's some homework for you too. And, and maybe um, listen to the playlist on your way to the Portland Art Gallery, where you can also enjoy some wonderful art. I'm Dr. Lisa Belial, and you have been listening to or watching Radio Maine.